election stalemate continues. President Donald Trump still tweeting he won as Joe Biden meets his transition team. Pro-life progress, a look at the gains made by politicians who fight for the unborn. And a second wave, more lockdown restrictions after a spike in infections and hospitals fill up. On EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, November 12th, 2020. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. Presumptive President-elect Joe Biden says that he spoke to Pope Francis today about their, quote, shared belief in the dignity and equality of all humankind. The statement comes despite Joe Biden's support for abortion. As far as President Trump, he is not conceding the race. He calls the election rigged and believes that he can still win Arizona. White House correspondent Owen Jensen is following it all for us tonight. Owen. Many world leaders have called presumptive president-elect Joe Biden to congratulate him. And today, the former vice president spoke directly to Pope Francis. The presumptive president-elect released a statement sharing details about his conversation with Pope Francis. The former vice president, a Catholic, told the Holy Father he wants to work together on issues such as caring for the marginalized and the poor, addressing the crisis of climate change, and welcoming and integrating immigrants and refugees. But Joe Biden, on his campaign website, lays out his agenda to support Roe v. Wade, restore federal funding for Planned Parenthood, the largest abortion provider in the U.S., and restore the Affordable Care Act's contraception mandate, among others, listed under, quote, reproductive health. Meanwhile, today, President Donald Trump had lunch with Vice President Mike Pence as the president does some math on Twitter, writing from 200,000 votes to less than 10,000 votes. If we can audit the total votes cast, we will easily win Arizona also. As for a recount in Arizona... There's simply no provision in state statute that allows for a recount that fall for a margin that falls outside of the trigger of 200 votes. And we're, we're certainly not going to hit that in this election. But in Georgia, preparing for a massive hand recount. But I mean, we're being compelled to do it, so we, we're going to have to execute it and do it as quickly and efficiently as possible. Ohio Republican Ohio. Governor Mike DeWine says... We need to consider... Um, uh, the former vice president as the president-elect. Uh, Joe Biden is the president-elect. As for the president's legal fight? Our courts are the best place, frankly, to adjudicate facts. Republican Senator James Langford says he'll intervene if Joe Biden does not start getting intelligence briefings by Friday. The Trump administration has not yet authorized the presumptive president-elect to see the secret reports. Also tonight, 709,000 people sought jobless benefits last week. A high number, obviously, but the best figure since going back to March. Good for the job market. Tracy? Oh, and I understand Joe Biden has chosen chief of staff. Tell me about that. That's right, Tracy. His longtime advisor, Ron Klain, who served as chief of staff for Joe Biden under former President Barack Obama during his first term. Tracy? Okay, thank you so much. And White House correspondent Owen Jensen reporting for us tonight. Our congressional Democrats say Republicans are denying reality and that GOP leaders should concede that the presidential election was won by Joe Biden. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales has been speaking with lawmakers today and has more. Eric. Well, Tracy, Democrats say it's time for Republicans to move on from the election and work on some real COVID relief for the country. But Republicans that I spoke with say that President Trump is well within his rights to contest the races and to make sure that the votes are tallied correctly. And they say it is now time for both sides to work together on COVID relief for the entire country. It's most unfortunate uh, that the Republicans have decided that they will not respect the will of the people. Democratic leaders from both chambers of Congress joined today to condemn the Republican president for not yet conceding the election. These frivolous lawsuits have less than a snowball's chance in hell of succeeding. Republican Senator James Inhofe tells me not so fast. Biden is not the president-elect. My feeling is he should be the president-elect before he's entitled to the information that the president would normally get. 
And GOP Senator Kevin Kramer of North Dakota tells me it's important to preserve election integrity no matter the result. I'm grateful that he's taking it on and um, I, I'm doubtful that it'll change the outcome, but, but the outcome isn't the issue. What's that issue is the rule of law and, and returning to a culture that, that where every vote matters. Both sides support spending more federal dollars to help Americans grapple with the fallout of the pandemic. But how much money and how to spend it, that's where there's still big disagreement. And the HEROES Act should be the starting point, not an emaciated bill that prioritizes protections for corporations and considers the needs of American families as an afterthought. The House Republican leader says Democrats are blocking aid designed for the Paycheck Protection Program. What did the Republicans do? We put on the floor 37 times to be able to vote for money for COVID, for PPP. There is more than $137 billion sitting there. It's only the date why you can't keep going out. The only thing that's standing in the way, in my view, is Speaker Pelosi. And today, the Senate Majority Leader called on both parties to uh, support COVID-19 vaccine when it becomes available to the public. Tracy. Well, Eric, it seems all eyes are focused right now on the Senate runoff races in Georgia that are taking place in January. What are you hearing from senators about it? You know, I spoke with uh, several senators about that, and uh, Senator Kramer from North Dakota, he told me that he actually plans to hold a number of fundraisers to help the GOP candidates. And then Senator John Kennedy of Louisiana, he plans to physically go down to the state of Georgia and to vote, and to, I mean, not to vote, but to help gain support for the two candidates. Tracy? Okay, thank you so much. Correspondent Eric Rosales reporting from Capitol Hill tonight. And joining me now on Skype with his analysis is Tom Bevan, co-founder and president of Real Clear Politics. Tom, welcome back. Good to speak with you again. Uh, we're following those legal challenges brought by the Trump campaign. What's the status of those lawsuits, and is there ev any evidence so far of systemic fraud? Well, <clears throat> there. I mean, the Trump campaign has filed a number of lawsuits in a number of states. In Michigan, for example, we just had a uh, suit filed to try and stop the certification of that vote. And there are plenty of, of affidavits the Trump campaign has compiled, uh, sworn statements from people who say they witnessed voter fraud, whether, whether that's considered systemic or widespread enough uh, to change the outcome there remains to be seen. Um, but as, as I think your reporter said, you know, the, the count begins tomorrow. There's an audit hand count in, in Georgia. And then Arizona is the other place where the Trump campaign, the problem for the Trump campaign is, number one, they have to prove widespread and systemic fraud not just in one state, but in three states. They have to overturn the vote count in three states in order for Donald Trump to, to win the presidency and win a, a second election. And right now, it does not seem that they have enough evidence in enough states of widespread fraud to make that happen. You know, there are Republicans who are standing behind the president in his legal efforts, but we're also starting to hear from more Republicans who are saying they're a little skeptical that these lawsuits will result in a path of victory for President Trump. What do you make of that, and what do you think it may indicate? Well, I think Republicans are trying to give Donald Trump his, you know, space to make his case in court and, and provide the evidence that the campaign has, has compiled. Uh, he, he has every right to do that. He should be able to do that. But... I think there's going to be, you know, very little tolerance for if these suits do not or make their way through court, if they get thrown out, um, for, for you know, not beginning the transition process, right? And, and we've seen some Republicans on Capitol Hill that are a little bit, uh, you know, hesitant about, about giving Donald Trump, you know, weeks and weeks uh, to continue to say that this election was stolen, that it's uh, fraud, and that he's able to prove it. He has his moment now, but he's, but but time is short. I think he's got to make his case, or Republicans are going to start to to move away from him. Yeah, well, Republicans and Democrats, as you know, are already looking ahead to the January Senate runoff elections in Georgia. Let's talk about that for a little bit and what you'll be watching for as both parties lay out their political strategies. Yeah, I mean, both parties are already uh, heavily invested in this, spending sending folks down there. Marco Rubio was down there the other day. Uh, we've got some early polling, you know, for what that's worth showing at a close race. Uh, but certainly, I think both parties are going to throw everything they have at this. The stakes could literally could not be higher. Um, if Democrats win both of these seats, they will be at a 50-50 Senate. 
Kamala Harris will be the tiebreaker if, if uh, you know, Joe Biden becomes the president. And so um, both campaigns are going to work very, very hard uh, to do. And we had a story today about how Republicans are now turned around and they are boosting vote by mail. They want people to vote by mail now. And so I'll be watching to see particularly can Democrats replicate what they just did in the suburbs around Atlanta? That is the entire ballgame for Democrats. They overperformed in the suburbs. Uh, Joe Biden did versus Hillary Clinton uh, four years ago. And so the question is, can they sustain that, especially when it's uh, in an off election, like a January 5th, uh, when people are going to be you know, going about their, their regular business? The state still leans Republicans. There are more Republicans there. So if Democrats cannot replicate that turnout, um, Republicans will probably come out on top. Well, Tom, thanks so much. We always appreciate your analysis. Tom Bevan, co-founder and president of Real Clear Politics. Thanks again. Thanks, Tracy. A surge in COVID-19 cases is breaking records across the United States with hospitals in some states filling up. All that we're doing right now doesn't seem to be having much impact on this curve. Uh, the case numbers are going up faster and faster every day, both for cases and for hospitalizations and deaths. Infections are now rising in 49 states, with Texas becoming the first state to report over 1 million cases. The governor of North Dakota warns that hospitals are full. In Ohio, the governor is reissuing a statewide mask order. And in New York, starting tomorrow, bars and restaurants will now have to close at 10 p.m. and indoor gatherings will be limited to 10 people. Church leaders in England and Wales are vowing to take action following a report that was highly critical of their response to clergy sexual abuse. Cardinal Vincent Nichols, head of the church in the UK, apologized to all of the victims. He also promised to take steps to make things more safe for children. The nearly 150-page report was compiled following an independent investigation. It was released on the same day that the Vatican published its findings on decades of sexual misconduct by former U.S. Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. Joining us now from Rome is Father Hans Zollner, member of the Pontifical Commission for the Protection of Minors and president of the Center for Child Protection. Father Zollner, welcome back. So good to see you. So what was your reaction to the findings of the U.K. report and the Vatican's probe into former Cardinal Theodore McCarrick? My reaction was that it is a, a very sad reading. Uh, it is uh, a very difficult to confront oneself with all what went wrong over decades. Uh, and it is also a, a reading that gave me hope, because uh, something like that uh, wouldn't have been possible three years ago. So we have a step forward uh, in the sense of transparency. And we have a major step forward in looking into the responsibility and accountability. Father, do you think changes can and do you think they will be made based on these two reports? I think there, there will be, uh, at least the change will be helped. Uh, we will certainly discuss this report in, at length uh, in various instances and in various circles. I'm pretty sure that it will have an influence on uh, what uh, the church thinks about the, the selection process of candidates to the bishophood. I think it will certainly have an impact on uh, the lines of command and uh, the lines of direction uh, and what is called the principle of accountability, so that we know now that uh, people uh, who don't do what they are supposed to do uh, at some stage uh, will, will have to, to be accountable for. Um, obviously, emotions are running very high right now. What would you say to the faithful who are upset or angry over these two reports? I'm, I'm absolutely with them. Uh, it is outrageous what has happened. Uh, we are looking now into something that has uh, taken place over 50 years, basically, and, and what went wrong. I mean, uh, the problem is that you, you look at that uh, as if it had happened today, because we uncovered it only now. It was uh, brought to the light only uh, uh, over the last years since the allegations um, against uh, Mr. McCarrick came forward that he had abused also minors, and, and all what was uh, brushed under the carpet in regard to abuse of uh, young seminarians or priests was not taken seriously. So we, we take notice now uh, of something that 
that has happened 30, 40 years ago, um, but only now um, we, we are aware of it or we have become aware uh, of the full scale of uh, those crimes and uh, those transgressions. Um, so uh, on one hand, one can uh, rightly be outraged, one can rightly be very angry and, and sad, but um, I mean, the paradoxical thing is since it has come out, we uh, we can also uh, share um, something of the truth. Um, we we can look into the eyes of reality, uh, even if it it was evil, and, and this is uh, the first step uh, and the major step forward for cleaning up. Uh, it, this is an important and necessary step um, for more transparency and accountability. And, the, and for me, actually, it is a major step uh, for uh, on the journey of hope. Well, Father, thank you so much for coming on and for your analysis. Father Hans Zollner, member of the Pontifical Commission for the Protection of Minors and president of the Center for Child Protection. Thank you again. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Coming up, analysis of the partisan divide in our country and the future for political parties. More than a week after Election Day, our nation remains divided. President Donald Trump has not conceded, and his team is pursuing lawsuits amid allegations of voter fraud. This, as presumptive, President-elect Joe Biden moves forward with his plans for transition. Joining me now on Skype to talk about the way forward is Robert George McCormick, professor of jurisprudence and director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. Robbie, welcome back. Always great to be with you. Um, as you know, several media outlets have called the presidential election in favor of Joe Biden. President Trump has not conceded and is also pursuing legal avenues based on claims of voter fraud. Robbie, what are your thoughts as you watch this all unfold and its significance? Well, my thoughts are that we have a system. We have a set of procedures. Uh, we have rules for recounts. We have uh, courts for challenging uh, electoral irregularities. Uh, the president and his supporters think that they've got evidence. Uh, they will present that evidence in court. Uh, the courts will decide uh, the question. There are procedures for recounts for in, in Georgia, for, uh, for example. Uh, that will be followed. My understanding now is there's going to be a hand recount in Georgia where the vote was uh, close. So my advice to everyone is to stay calm. Uh, the system will work. Uh, we have good institutions and good procedures. The courts are open. Uh, we will get a resolution of this in due course. Uh, in the meantime, just stay calm. That's all we can do. Uh, Joe Biden has vowed throughout the campaign and again last Saturday to govern as an American president, working as hard for those who didn't vote for him as those who did. Now, given the deep divide in our country right now, how do you think that message is being received or do you think it's just falling on deaf ears? Well, I'm afraid I can't believe that um, Joe Biden actually means it. Um, this has been a very uh, polarized election. Both candidates uh, contributed to the rhetoric that caused it to be uh, so polarized. The country's polarized. Uh, the, the campaign reflected that polarization. Uh, Joe Biden has committed himself to a set of policies that are simply antithetical to the views of many, many of our fellow citizens. I'm one of them, especially when it comes to issues of the sanctity of human life, marriage and the family, religious liberty and the rights of conscience. He has vowed on the very first day of uh, a Biden administration uh, to repeal crucial uh, pro-life protections, such as the Mexico City policy, to begin pouring more money uh, into abortion, uh, not only here in the United States, where he would repeal the Hyde Amendment, but internationally, turning the faucet back on uh, at even a higher volume or volume flow uh, for, um, for Planned Parenthood. Uh, he has vowed to uh, make a high priority, the highest priority, the Equality Act, which I really believe is an inequality act, which in the name of advancing LGBTQ rights will profoundly undermine uh, the freedom of Catholics uh, and other believers in traditional morality and marriage and the family. So there's no way if Biden is faithful, as he undoubtedly will be, uh, to those who uh, put him in power, 
uh, that uh, he will not act in such a way that uh, will deeply alienate uh, a substantial portion of the population. Uh, Robbie, in your opinion, what do you think it's going to take to unite us, given the fact that, you know, we're up against so much right now and not even just the election? Well, it's hard to see uh, a way through to unity here. Um, the country is just very, very badly polarized. We just have to try to uh, come to terms with that division in the country, the fact that we have to live with each other. Uh, despite the fact that we profoundly disagree on some very, very important issues. Uh, if indeed there is a Biden administration, that Biden administration will once again sue the nuns, sue the little sisters of the poor to try to enforce the contraception abortifacient uh, mandate uh, uh, that uh, uh, is in federal law uh, as, as they interpret it. So uh, uh, it's hard to know uh, how we get out of that. <laughs> Uh, but we, we're going to have to learn to live together. I, it would be good, I think, if uh, politicians and others who are high profile uh, would set a good example in their rhetoric. And neither President uh, Trump uh, nor Vice President Biden has been exemplary in the rhetoric they have, uh, have used to try to uh, avoid causing the kind of bitterness and hatred that we have between citizens uh, today. But the disagreements are very, very deep. I think rhetoric matters. I think the language is important. Uh, but those differences will not go away no matter what language we use. I think the key thing actually is that we need to not lose faith in the basic system, in the constitutional system. And that's the problem right now with the uh, circumstances of the election. Uh, any way you look at it, half the population roughly is going to think that this was an illegitimate election. In the same way, that in 2016, 40 percent or more of the country believed that it was an illegitimate election, believing that there was Russian interference in the election that had put Trump into office. So uh, you had in 2016 Democrats thinking it's an illegitimate presidency. If you get a Biden presidency, you will have in 2020 Republicans thinking that you have an illegitimate uh, presidency. Uh, people do not believe the system is working, that constitutional norms and structures are being uh, respected. It's a dangerous situation, and I, I wish I had some words of comfort there, but I don't. It's a very dangerous, volatile situation. Yeah. Well, Robbie, thanks so much for coming on. We do always appreciate your analysis and hearing from you. Robert George McCormick, Thank Professor you. of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. Always great to be with you, Robbie. Thank you. Up next... New developments in whether the Supreme Court will hear arguments on a case involving abortion and the state of Mississippi. Pro-life advocates are hopeful the Supreme Court will review an abortion law in Mississippi, even though the court once again delayed its decision on whether to hear the case. Mississippi passed the ban in 2018, but it was challenged immediately. The high court was supposed to announce last Friday if it would take up the Mississippi law. On Monday, it again delayed a decision. It is the fifth delay since September. Meanwhile, on Capitol Hill, pro-life senators say they will aggressively continue their fight for the unborn. One of them explains their plans to Catherine Hadro, host of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. We want to make sure that we protect the important wins we have for the pro-life movement. The Hyde uh, defunding Planned Parenthood, Title X, Mexico City, and also ensuring that we keep these good pro-life judges moving forward here on the bench. Senator Steve Daines, a Republican from Montana, also reacts to so many pro-life lawmakers keeping their Senate seats in the 2020 campaign. Tonight on EWTN Pro-Life Weekly at 10 p.m. Eastern. And finally tonight, speaking of Catherine Hadro, she says the 2020 election was a huge boost to the culture of life. And she cites the surge in pro-life females who were elected as members of Congress. In an article for the National Catholic Register, she writes in part, quote, this trend of voters choosing pro-life representation over abortion extremism is reflected all over the U.S. map. The American people who largely reject the abortion agenda continue to speak 
at the polls. For more on this story, including a look at the pro-life candidate who defeated the Health and Human Services Secretary under Democrat President Bill Clinton, visit the National Catholic Register at ncregister.com. We thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.